Good morning. Merry Christmas Eve. That was a really tired Merry Christmas Eve. Were you guys all out late last night? I mean, you know. Merry Christmas Eve. There you go. Now, now you're awake and I'm awake and that's a good thing. So it's, it's good to be in God's house as we celebrate uh, this birth of Christ as we celebrate together this morning and then as we come back this evening. I did want to give, uh, before we start, I wanted to give one little logistical uh, thing, um, and that is in your bulletin, not in mine, but in yours, you have an envelope, Christmas offering, Christ's birthday offering, whatever we have stamped on there. Uh, so uh, we're taking a special offer for uh, Nision, and uh, you, some of you gave last week with that envelope. Some of you may choose to give this week through that envelope. And then whatever we collect uh, this evening in the evening offering will go towards Nision. It's sort of our way to give back um, to Christ for the, his gift of his life. Um, but I just wanted, several people had asked me, what's with the envelope and, and so forth. But that will all go to Nision to help them uh, to re, uh, with their the ministry that they do there. So if you want to give to that, you can put in, you're not going to be back this evening, you can put in that envelope this morning and it will be uh, credited in that direction. So we have a unique situation that doesn't happen that often. And that is the fourth Sunday of Advent falls on Christmas Eve. It's not a normal thing. It doesn't normally work out this way, but it does this year. And that means we are both expecting and receiving in the same day, which really kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, we expect the Christ child to come. We've been building our anticipation. We've been looking forward to that. We have been preparing. Now, some of us prepare a little later than others. I'm not naming names. But someone may have decorated his Christmas tree yesterday. Just saying. You got to sort of slide into this, you know. Um, and with all that that's going on, as we've talked about, it's important for us to have these times together as family where we can sit and be still. Because there's a lot of rush going on. In fact, that was one of the things I do like about Christmas Eve and the fourth Sunday of Advent falling on the same one is I am not tempted on that Saturday to try and do any big church activity because I know everybody else is doing all sorts of stuff and no one's going to show up for it because you're all busy. Which means I get a nice quiet time. And it's important to have those. Because I think that's one of the problems that we have is that we race and race because we're trying to get to the perfect Christmas. We're trying to get the things done right. We've got to get the cookies made. We've got to get the stuff put together. We've got parties to go to and activities to go to. And if you have children, I add a whole nother layer of Christmas programs at this activity or that activity and so forth. And it is so easy. And we say it every year. But it's true. It's so easy to get lost in the rush and not have the moments to sit and pray and sing and listen and let the Spirit come. God's greatest gift was His demonstration of His love by sending His Son, Jesus Christ. And as we come to the fourth Sunday of Advent, it's the Advent of Candle of Love, where we remember, for God so loved the world that He sent His only Son. And I don't know if we ever really think about this. But you know how much it cost God to give us that gift? I mean, I, I don't know how, how you shop for your Christmas gifts. But at a certain point, one of the things that I pay attention to is that price at the end, right? Otherwise, you'd all got Ferraris for Christmas. But I pay attention to that because I have limited resources, just like you do. But God said, I will give you everything that I have because I will give you myself. And it cost him everything to leave heaven, to come to earth, to walk one day among the angels and the next day 
to be found lying in a manger. To live in a realm that does not have pain and hunger and sorrow in the same way to suddenly being here on earth where Jesus experienced all those. Where there was no temptation ever to God. And then suddenly to have to face temptation. Living in the realm where the angels know who you are and recognize you for who you are and know that you created the heavens and the earth and then to walk among the creation that does not recognize you and does not care for you. God gave up a lot to come to earth, but that tells us how much he loved us. This morning, no, God loves you. And his demonstration of his love for you is what we celebrate this Christmas season. His love of his son, Jesus Christ. And know that you are worth that love because God looked down and said, I'm willing to do this because I made you and I love you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us this day. As we come into your house, as we still ourselves for these few moments, that we might rest in your love. That you might restore us and equip us and encourage us. That we might hear the song of the angels. That we might receive your peace on earth, goodwill to men. And that we might know afresh how much you love us. And we welcome your Christ child. We welcome your son, our Messiah, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken since Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in snugly strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Amen.
Oh, he's he he thought of see, yes. See, this is this is what we need. Yes. I've heard about this baby boy who come to earth and bring us joy, and I just want to sing this song to you. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift, and every breath is singing, hallelujah, 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 Expecting child, they'd search the inn To find a place for you were coming soon There was no room for them to stay So a manger that was filled with hay And God's only son was born on Hallelujah Hallelujah left their flocks at night to see this baby wrapped in light a host of angels left them all to you Shone bright up in the east To Bethlehem the wise men three Came many miles and journeyed long for you And to that place at which you were And frankincense and golden myrrh They gave to you and cried out To be a man one day to die for me and you. My sins would drive the nails of you. That rugged cross was my cross too. Till every breath you drew was hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
it is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary soul rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, God divine, oh, night, when Christ was born. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we, let all within us praise his holy name.
we've been looking at the carols of Christmas, and today we'll take a look at Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and tonight we'll look at Silent Night a little bit, and then uh, we'll be doing O Holy Night uh, next Sunday and focusing on that as well. But we've done a couple surveys. We've done oldest Christmas carols. We did most popular sacred Christmas carols. Last week we had some disputes over the most popular secular Christmas carols. So I decided just to really kick the bee's nest over, and we will do the top 17 Christmas movies by people I know or may see in the mirror. 17. The Hallmark Channel. Pick one. I don't care. It's plug and play. I love them because, well, you know what? It always ends well. And there's enough in the world that doesn't end well. I'm happy to have the Hallmark Channel. But just pick whichever one you like. They're, they're somewhat interchangeable. Yes. Number 16 is not a personal favorite of mine. I have to be honest. I've never actually watched this all the way through. But I am sharing the love with those that are younger than me that do enjoy this, The Nightmare Before Christmas, 1993. It's actually kind of fun, I'm told. Number 15, and this hurts me to say, but if I don't, there's some of you will come unhinged, because I personally do not think that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, but some of you cannot celebrate Christmas until someone has fallen from the top of the tower. That's just the way that one goes. It's yeah, not you, Gina. I, I totally know. That's Number 14, the Santa, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, the 1970 claymation animation thing that kind of freaked us all out. <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, another one of those kind of semi-creepy Christmas things from my childhood. 1964, older than me. Miracle on 34th Street. 1947 version, White Christmas, 1954, which I saw uh, for the first time, what was it, 2000, it was Christmas of 2019, wasn't it? Our local theater there had one of the old silver screens, and they did the classics on there, and they did uh, White Christmas. Uh, it was really good. A Christmas Carol. Now, you can, there's a more versions of this than you can shake sticks at. The 1970 version is the one that I always think of. Some of you are big 1985 George C. Scott fans, so I put them both in there. It's, it's a pick em at that point. Uh, that, that may be the most retold Christmas story uh, in every... Because every TV series has to have a version of that. Oh, we missed one. Tin... Nine, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. This is the 2000 Jim Carrey version. I get nods over here. Home Alone, 1990. A total example of bad parenting. But remember this. He was left alone for three days and he still made it to church. So you can make it to church too. <laughs> Just saying. And he had guys trying to kill him, so... National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, always the classic. The Muppet Christmas Carol, you knew that one was going to show up here. I was kind to some of you and only left it ranked at six, but this is a standard in my house. Number five, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the original 1966 classic, followed by Elf, 2003. A Charlie Brown Christmas, 1965. A Christmas Story, 1983. It will be played 24 hours nonstop on some channel. And we will, if we have that channel, we will tune in at some point because, you know, it just goes on and on. And then, not my favorite, but this is a nod to all of you who would give me walking papers if I didn't include this at number one. It's a Wonderful Life, the 1946, which is really dark and dreary and just odd to me, but. For some of you, it's not Christmas. The, you know, the bell rings and angels get their wings. So this is... What's interesting, though, how many of you agreed with every one of those? None of you did. We all come to Christmas with different expectations. Different likes and different dislikes. 
different wants and needs. And even in our own lives, from one Christmas to the next, they're different, aren't they? Sometimes we go through seasons of, you know, young couple, children, when we are children, when we have children, when we're getting older, when children come, when we're by ourselves. We all have different things going on at Christmas. And so our likes in the carols, the Christmas songs, the movies, even the Christmas cookies that we like will all differ because we're just different. But there is one thing that is universal for everybody, and that is our need for the Savior which was born on Christmas Day. Our need for that one who would come and show us what true love was, that would love us so much that he would lay his life down for us, that he would be the one that would set us free from sin and death and the fear that chains us and all those things that bind us the one that the angels came and sang and praised the lord for because they were celebrating his birth now i don't know what it looked like in heaven when god informed the angels that jesus was coming to earth (laughs) to be born as a human i don't know how that process went But somebody up there had to go, um, question, I know you're omniscient and you know everything and I know you're all powerful and you're God, but really? (laughs) You think that if you send your son to this group of people, this rabble that has been rebelling against you since, you know, early, I mean like real early, who you've pursued over and over again, who you've demonstrated your power and your love and your grace and your might to countless times, which you have delivered and rescued over and over again, and how many times have they turned their back? Do you really think they're going to believe? Do you really think it's going to change anything? And yet we know it does to those that believe. That it's the only thing that changes anything when you believe. And Hark the Herald Angels, this announcement, is this classical, I mean, if you wanted to encompass the gospel story, the good news of Jesus Christ in any one hymn that we sing at Christmas, Hark the Herald Angels probably is that one that has the theology and everything right. Well, it ought to because it was written by who? Charles Wesley, whose brother's name was... John Wesley, very good. And John Wesley was a powerhouse of a preacher. Now, he was a failed missionary to the United States. He was really bad at that. But he went back and met some of these Moravians on the boat and discovered something. He knew a whole lot about Jesus. He grew up in a godly home. He had gone to seminary. He knew a lot about Jesus. But it wasn't until he met the Moravians that he came to understand what it meant to know Jesus. And he found, as they were sailing back from the United States, having failed, he and his brothers Charles failed at their mission journey, had washed up as missionaries at the Episcopal Church just down the road here, actually, or down the bay, you might say. They got caught in a terrible storm. And in the midst of that storm, there was a group of Moravians going back, and they were praising the Lord and praying and peaceful, and they weren't crying out. They weren't terrified. They were at peace. And John and Charles thought their, their boat was going down. There was not a lot of peace. And it stunned John because he was like, I don't have peace in the midst of this. And they do. And it was because they knew who Jesus was. Now, a few years later, he would sort that out at his Alders Gate experience. And he would accept Jesus in his heart. And he would begin to understand what it means to truly have the peace of God in you. And he went on to preach one of the greatest revival preachers in England's history. He and one of his best friends, George Whitefield. Um, And his brother Charles wrote lots of our hymns. And he wrote the first, uh, this hymn, first titled Hymn for Christmas Day in 1739. And it started with that wonderful tripping off your tongue line, Hark how all the welkin rings, glory to the King of Kings. Okay, that, maybe that's not exactly how we sing it. 
Well, and we also didn't use that tomb, and it was tune. It was really somber and dark. And George Whitfield got a hold of it in 1758. Said, "You know what, Charles? You write some amazing stuff. This may not be one of them." <laughs> and he changed the line to "Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King." He rearranged it a little bit, but the tune was still not that catchy until William H. Cummings came along in 1855. He says, you know what? Mendelssohn's got some good stuff. And I'm going to take some of that and I'm going to put it in this. And that's how we ended up with Hark the Herald Angels as we sing it today. It took a number of people. It was a process. Not unlike our own Christian lives, right? It's a process. We start out with our faith. And we want to believe and we want to trust. And over years and time, as people speak into our lives, and as the Holy Spirit grows in us, our faith grows until we become more and more of the representation of who Jesus Christ is in our lives. Now, what's interesting about this is let's just kind of read through this and think about the verses. Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Jesus came to be the peace between us and God and us and each other. He made the way. He made it possible. Joyful all ye nations rise. Join the triumph in the skies. That's the angelic host. With angelic host proclaim, Christ, the Messiah, is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Not of an earthly kingdom. Not with a throne sitting in some city. But one who dwells in our hearts as the king of our lives and the king over the kingdom of God. Christ by highest heaven adored. Christ the everlasting Lord. The one who was there in the beginning, as John tells us, who was part of the creation. Late in time, behold, He comes to us. He doesn't stay in heaven. He comes to us. Offspring, the child of the virgin's womb. Veiled in flesh, draped in flesh, clothed to look like us, in the fullness of God, was pleased to dwell in Him, but He was fully man. He wasn't God who put on a skin suit. He became one of us. He became fully us. He had the same hungers and pains and joys and sorrows and temptations that we did. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail, that should be hail, not jail. <laughs> Spell check does not get that one. I won't even tell you how many times I had to change angles to angels. <laughs> but I did. Hail the incarnate deity. God become flesh. The word became flesh and literally in the Greek, tabernacled, pitched his tent among us. He became one of us. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Pleased to be a man. <laughs> he was happy to be with us. Jesus, our God with us, our Emmanuel. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Verse 3, hail the heaven-born prince of peace, the one who comes from heaven. Hail the son of righteousness, the son of God, the righteous one. Light and life to all he brings. Why? Because he was there in the beginning. Risen with healing in His wings. He makes us whole again. His healing is not just the physical, although it is that. It is the spiritual. How many times in the Old Testament does God say, I will heal your heart? Because it is sick with sin. Risen with healing in His wheel. Mild He lays His glory by. He, Jesus, who is the very form of God, did not count it his right to continue to be God, but laid his glory beside so that he might come and dwell with us. He set it aside. Mild he lays his glory by, born that men and women no more may die. Born to raise the sons and daughters of earth. Born to give them second birth. 
to give them another chance, to start over in a new life, come to make it so that they don't fear death and the end, that fear does not overcome them, but they have freedom today to live a new life set free from sin through His sacrifice on the cross and His resurrection from the grave. Give them second birth a spiritual birth, into a new life that each of us can have when we put our faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Now, you could close your hymnals now and you'd be done singing the song. But not the way Charles wrote it and not the way that George kept it because you need verse 4. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. Come and set up your house here in us. Rise the woman's conquering seed. Bruise in us the serpent's head. Come, defeat Satan. This picks up that line at the fall. Remember when Eve and Adam eat the forbidden fruit? And it says, in the curse of the serpent, it says, you will strike their heel and their offspring will what? Strike your head. Referring to Jesus Christ. He is the conquering seed. He is the one that comes into our lives and He defeats the serpent's head, Satan. Now display Thy saving power. Your power to overcome and set us free. Ruin nature now. Restore our sinfulness, our old ways, our habits of rebellion and in bondage are turning our back on You. Now our ruined nature is being restored to what it was intended to be through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Now in mystic union, join Thine to ours and ours to Thine. Charles Wesley picks up this wonderful line in the Old Testament and we hear it again in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. And I will be their God and they will be My people and I will dwell among them. Christ came so that He might dwell among us and now in us. That we might be fully His as He is fully ours. And verse 5, while we're on a roll, Adam's likeness, Lord, efface. Stamp Thy image in its place. We took on the old Adam, as Paul said. We, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But through Jesus Christ, He comes to stamp a new image in its place. Not that of sin and failure and death, but of life and hope and joy and peace and wholeness. Second Adam from above, that's Paul talking about Jesus as the second Adam. Reinstate in us thy love. Put it again. again. We've forgotten what it means to love. We have forgotten what it means to live with the love of God. We've changed it to transaction. We've changed it to pleasure. We've changed it to all sorts of things. But he says, reinstate, let us through, reinstate in us thy love, that sacrificial love that we might love you and everyone else. Let us thee, though lost regain, thee the life, the inner man, O oh, to all thyself impart, form in each believer's heart. That which we've lost, that Spirit of God through our sinfulness, reinstate it, refill us, give us that new hope, wash out that old that wears us out and tears us down and uses us up and reinstate that new life in our inner man. O oh, to all thyself impart, formed in each believer's heart. Come into our Lord, in our lives, and give us exactly what we need so that we might be formed again in your heart as you created us to be. The good news. You see, the presence of God always leads, as I've said over and over again, to freedom, to wholeness, and to shalom. But the reality is we have to take the gift. We have to pick it up. We have to unwrap it. I mean, someone can give you a gift. And you leave it wrapped. Uh, how many people here are thrilled to have a Christmas present under their tree and never unwrap it? Right? No. What do we want to do? In fact, the question is, can I open it now... 
or do I have to wait, right? How often do we take the gift of Jesus Christ, the gift of life and hope and forgiveness and grace and wholeness, and leave it wrapped up instead of picking it up and enjoy it? How often does the world look at that present laying there year after year and walk away from it, not knowing that it's the very gift of life, it's the very gift that they need? But see, we have to take the gift because peace from God always requires belief and faith and trust in God's Son, Jesus, who is the Messiah. Unless we pick up the gift of Jesus and put it in our hearts, unless we believe in Him, that peace will not come. You can have all the nativity sets. I just got another one today. I haven't even told Tina yet. I got a new inflatable one. It's not even out of the box yet. Someone brought it to me. I'm so excited. She asked me the other day, she said, okay, which nativity set are we putting up? I said, well, we're putting up the lobster one this year. You don't have a lobster one? We have a lobster one. We have a crocheted one, a dear sister in our church gave us at, at Maple Grove. We have the olive wood one that my parents brought back from the Holy Land. I gave away one inflatable nativity set. I've got another one now. I'm excited to open that box. But we have to embrace that Messiah that comes. We can set all of our nativity sets out. We can sing all the carols. We can put all the decorations up and make the perfect party. But if we never put our faith in Jesus Christ, then that Christmas has just come as another holiday. At that point, we just call it a hallmark holiday because it doesn't mean anything without the Savior. He is the reason for the season. It's not, it's not a quip. It's not a, a gotcha. It's the basis of that. So how do we do that? First is the act of believing in the good news. The act of believing. Believing in the good news that Jesus came for us. And I want to say something about this. Because at the point that the good news of the gospel becomes bad news from someone and you think it's great fun that it's bad news for somebody else, you've lost the point of the good news. The good news. The angels didn't come to declare war on humanity. They came to praise the Savior which came. They didn't commission the shepherds to go and assault all those who didn't believe. They commissioned the shepherds to go and see and hold and believe and then tell people the good news. The good news is always good news. And if we make it anything that's not good news, that's not freedom, that's not love, that's not peace, that's not joy and not hope, then we have lost sight of that. It is never a weapon. And it's there as an act of believing. Those angels sang to those shepherds. And at the end of that, the shepherds didn't go, well, that was weird. Hope they don't come back tomorrow night and wake me up. No, they said, let's go see what the angels have said. They acted out the invitation. They went, they went looking. And until we go looking for him, He's just there. We have to make the trip. We have to act out our belief. I will pick up and I will go see what this good news is. And then we have to welcome and receive the gift. I love all these silly pictures that we see of the nativity scene. And baby Jesus is laying there in the manger and everybody's looking at him. Oh, look at the cute. Have you ever walked around a, 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 a baby and someone didn't try and pick that thing up? That's what you do with babies, right? You pick them up and you pass them around. And if you don't try to do that, do you know what the mother does to you? Want to hold them? <laughs> Which is incredible trust on her part. I, I, I was terrified of babies when I started in ministry because I had never had a child. My own. I didn't know they bounce. I thought they were more like china teacups, you know, and if you lose one bad things happen. I'm not saying it's good to drop a baby, and I've never dropped one that wasn't mine. But you want to pass them around. Everybody wants you to hold the baby. I mean, growing up on Cattle Ranch with hard, gnarled cowboys who were not kind and gentle in any stretch of the imagination, you plop a grandbaby down in that crowd, 
You bring a baby to the table, and what do they all want to do? They want to touch the baby. They want to hold the baby. You see, we need to have the same kind of approach to the baby Jesus. We need to stop leaving Him in the manger and start picking Him up and holding Him and welcoming Him and receiving the gift that's given to us. It's not a museum piece. You don't walk around and go, don't touch it, it might break. Pick it up because it's going to break for you. For your sins. So that it might become one with you. And then you have to embrace the new truth of God's love lived out daily. You need to let that baby change your life. There are those of us that grew up in the church. Sometimes it's the hardest way to truly embrace Jesus Christ in your life. Because you're so used to the rules. And well, you do this, you behave this way, you act this way. And you come to this strange idea that if you just do the right things, then that's salvation and that's faith. And it's not. It's only when you confess your sins and you welcome into your heart and He begins to transform your life so that you begin to reflect more of who this Jesus Christ is that wants to live in us. This Christ that we read about in Scripture who loved and cared and confronted this Christ who brought love to those around Him. You have to pick Him up and embrace Him in your daily life so that your love is lived out and people see that there is something different. Those shepherds were never the same. And not just because Gabriel shows up in the middle of them and goes, Hello! They were changed because they went and saw the Messiah and they picked him up and they came to know him. And then they did what? They went and told everybody. I don't know what time it was in the morning on that first Christmas Eve. I mean, Christmas Day. I don't know. You know, my daughter got up at 4 a.m. one time. Because, it, you know, it's Christmas morning. You've got to get up to get the presents open. I don't know. I was not happy about that. Thank God she grew out of that phase. Otherwise, duct tape would have been involved. But <laughs> handy dandy parenting tip for those that might just want to know Christmas morning duct tape works. Well, not on the child. Duct tape their door shut. But those shepherds were obnoxious that next day. Because what did they talk about all day? Jesus. And what do you think they talked about the next day? Jesus. To everybody. Why? Because it was the greatest thing in the world. We love to tell everybody about our special gifts. We need to tell them about Jesus. And make sure and remember that it is good news that we are sharing. The angels come. And they proclaim, There's peace on earth, goodwill to men to those who put their faith and trust in this Messiah. There is freedom and wholeness. There is peace and hope and joy. There is forgiveness and grace and mercy and there is a new beginning. And that is the good news of Christmas. And the good news about that is it doesn't matter where we've been it doesn't matter what we've done in our past. It doesn't even matter where we're at at that moment when we simply say, Jesus, I need you. I need your grace and mercy. Forgive me and lead me. Call me into your presence. And he is there. And he walks with us each and every day when you put your faith in him. Start this Christmas so that you truly might know what the angels sang about. And you might truly know why Christmas is good news. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, help us this day to hear your angels sing, to go and seek after your Son, Jesus the Christ. Help us to pick him up and hold him close and embrace him and allow him to transform our lives and dwell inside us so that we might have your new life. And help us to go and tell everybody the good news that Christ has come and freedom and hope and salvation is for everyone this day and every day. Help us to sing. Help us to live. In Christ's name, amen. amen. A couple of announcements here. Um, no, Wednesday evening, no Wednesday morning Bible study or family night. Please check the box outside there in the narthex for your Christmas cards from the Jenkins family that have been dropped off there. 
You might also pick up your 2024 giving envelopes. If you don't use a box or you don't see, you have not used a box or you don't see on it or you would like a box or a number, see Sherry. She handles all those things, sort of. <laughs> now she does. Actually, I think Ginger assigns that, but you know, at some point people get tired of me saying see Ginger, so. Walk the walk, we were able to bless 68 children with Christmas presents. Thank you to all of you that helped out. We also passed out 18 food baskets. Thank you for those that helped in giving and carrying and delivering and putting those together. Remember the Nisian offering uh, envelope in your bulletins as well as there's a red sheet in there that has uh, the uh, in memory and honor of uh, for those that donated poinsettias. This evening uh, we will be having a can our candlelight service at 5 p.m. There's only one service. We'll do candle lighting for that. And I encourage you to come and be a part of it. It will be a different service. Okay. Um, and it's a, it is a different service than tonight, but I'll be honest with you. It's the Christmas story. We're going to read it. We're going to sing the songs. Not all of them we sang today, but we're going to sing the songs. So don't come back and say, you know, we sang Hark the Herald Angels sing this morning. Yes, we did. And yes, we will. <laughs> and then at the end, we will sing Silent Night for those of you that have been waiting. We will light candles and we will sing joy to the world and we'll take the good news out and celebrate with our family and with the world. So come and be a part of the Christmas Eve service. Dan, do you have stuff downstairs? Uh, yes, we have a nice selection downstairs, but I want to add to the thanks. The uh, bags program at Green Valley has been going very well. Uh, so well, they ran out of bags last night and had to pack another 150. Good so uh, we're coming up close to 1,000 bags. Uh, and that was the goal for the whole month. So we're going to probably go over the goal. Good. And thank you to everyone who's contributed there. And thank you to everyone who's told the manager thank you. Uh, and come on downstairs. We have a nice selection down there for you today. Uh, Come on down and help yourself. If you want to leave a donation, please do. Thank you. Very good. If God has been speaking to you or you're walking through some difficult times in your life, especially at this season, uh, and you would like someone to pray with you after the service, the deacons will be down front here, and they would uh, love to be able to pray with you and uh, spend some time uh, talking with you, and I encourage you to do that. Very good. Go be kind. Go be light in the darkness. Be back tonight or next Sunday. Till then, may you know the love of God, the salvation of Jesus Christ, and may the Holy Spirit hold you in his hand now and forever, and may you truly receive the Christ that is in Christmas. Amen. Go in his peace.